Ready to continue your cross-examination of uh, Dr. Miller? I am, Your Honor. Very well. Let me remind the witness you're still under oath. Yes, Your Honor. The oath that you took yesterday applies to this testimony as well. Yes, Your Honor. Very well. Proceed, Mr. Boyce. Good morning, Professor Miller. Good morning, Mr. Boyce. Um, as a housekeeping matter, Your Honor, I would offer at this time Plaintiff's Exhibit 794A, which was the um, index of materials relied on by the witness that he circled those that he identified as his own, um, uh, did not circle those that were provided by counsel, and then put question marks about those who he didn't know which was which. No objection. Let me just see if I understand. The circled ones are the ones that he found. Yes. Question marks he doesn't remember, and the balance were furnished by counsel. Yes. Very well. Thank you. Um, that exhibit will be admitted. It's not marked as, and I'll ask the clerk to so mark it. Ah, all right. Now, at the um, break, Professor Miller, um, we were talking about polls, and you said that you might have seen some polls, but you didn't um, recall, and I had asked you to look at tab 78. Do you recall that? I don't think we actually looked at No, I don't think we actually got there, but I'd asked you to look at it. I'd ask you to look at it now. Here, I have it here. I'm sorry, say again? Oh, I, I have it in the tab here. Yes. Okay. Um, now, uh, this is um, the exit polls um, that were taken following Proposition 8. Um, have you seen this before? I believe I have seen this um, as well as a couple of other exit polls. Um, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2853. No objection, Your Honor. That number again, sir? Uh, 2853. Thank you. Um, now, from looking at the um, exit polls that you looked at, uh, was it clear to you that people who attended church um, more often were highly more likely to vote yes on Proposition 8 than other people? I'm looking at the exhibit here. If, um, My question actually had to do with what your state of mind was. We'll go to the exhibit. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's fair based on a number of surveys that I've seen. Um, I can't remember whether the Los Angeles Times poll, um, this poll, some um, post-election analysis by uh, Patrick Egan and Ken Sherrill all inform my view about this. And I think it is fair to say that um, those who are more frequent uh, uh, attenders of religious services were more in favor of Proposition 8 than, than other people by a considerable amount. And if you turn to page 8, where it talks about vote by church attendance in the middle. Do you see that? Yes. And it says that the 32 percent of the population that attended church weekly voted yes on Proposition 8 84 percent of the time. Do you see that? I do see that, yes. Is that consistent with your understanding? Um, I don't know if it, um, if it would be 84, but it would be a high percentage. That's consistent. And um, everybody else um, voted no more than they voted yes, correct? Broken into three categories. The occasional attenders voted no by narrow margin and the people who never attended church in this poll was by a, a large margin. Well, now, when you say the people that attended occasionally voted no by a narrow margin, they voted no 54 percent of the time, correct? 54 to 46 is what it says here. Yes. yes. And um, uh, that was a margin that was greater than the final margin in terms of the actual vote, correct? The final vote was about 52 to 48, so. So the answer to my question is yes? 
Narrowly, yes. Yes, that's true. Um, now, could we put up the uh, defendant's demonstrative uh, 25? <clears throat> Well, while we're doing that, um, Professor Miller, uh, one of the uh, strong allies of the uh, gay and lesbian community that you identified um, were labor unions, correct? Correct. Now, did you investigate how members of labor unions actually voted in um, the Proposition 8 election? Uh, I don't recall if I've looked at exit polls that broke it down by uh, union membership, or I don't recall what the, the vote was. Um, well, let's look at page 12 and see if that refreshes your recollection. All right. See the third item down that breaks people down based on whether they have a union member in the household? Yes. And. Of the people who had a union member in the household, 56% voted yes, correct? According to this poll, that's correct. Do you have any reason to doubt that? I don't have any reason to doubt that. I haven't, I haven't looked at the methodology of this poll, but I, I don't have any reason to doubt it. And is it consistent with your understanding that a majority of the people with a union member in the household voted in favor of Proposition 8? Now, this would be evidence to suggest that's the case. Do you know of any evidence to suggest that's not the case? I haven't really investigated it closely. Um, now, let me ask you to look at uh, your demonstrative 25. And this was a list of professional associations that favored gay and lesbian marriage, correct? Uh, I, I can't remember whether I said it was marriage or um, LGBT rights. but it. Well, let me ask you. Do these professional associations um, favor gay and lesbian marriage? Some associations within these categories did, yes. When you were going through this long list of churches and labor unions and professional associations um, that you said were in favor of gays and lesbians, um, were you meaning to say that they were in favor of gay and lesbian marriage or that they were simply in favor of certain gay and lesbian rights? Uh, I think most of them that I looked at uh, came from support um, for the Leno bills in the California legislature, which would have created gender-neutral marriage in California, as well as amicus briefs in Strauss versus Horton uh, or in re marriage cases, which would have established uh, same sex marriage in California. So those would have all been in the category of supporters of same sex marriage. With respect to these associations, I'm not sure I have your testimony. What is your testimony my, about these? My, my com I'm confident that um, there were groups in each of these categories that have supported same sex marriage. Well, let's go through those categories. First, psychologists. Um, have you investigated why psychologists and psychologist associations favor same-sex marriage? I don't believe I've read any um, position statements by them on this. I've just seen being registered as supporters of the legislation or the litigation. So, as I understand it, you have seen them um, be in favor of it, but you haven't investigated why they're in favor of it. Is that fair? Psychologists, I have not, no. Okay. Uh, let's take psychiatrists. Um, have you investigated why psychiatrists are in favor and why psychiatrist associations are in favor of same-sex marriage? No, I have not. Um, let's take something closer to home. <laughs> university professors. Um, have you investigated why university professors and university professor associations are in favor of same-sex marriage? Uh, I would, 
There's a, I, I think there's an actual support uh, by the California State Faculty Association. I haven't read that. I can say based on my own um, experience as a univer university professor and somebody in that um, arena that for the most part I think it would go to the norm of fairness. Um, that would be an important consideration for many university professors. Uh, now, legal organizations. Um, have you investigated why legal organizations support same-sex marriage? I don't know if I've, already, if, if I've read any position papers, but again, I would say it would be the, probably for the same reason, um, a, a commitment to the norm of fairness and equality. Um, uh, let me ask you to look at tab 103. Now, this is a um, Gallup News Service poll uh, dated February 20, 2007, um, and it's Defendant's Exhibit 271. Um, have you reviewed this uh, document? I believe this is one of the polls that I, I reviewed, but I, I can't recall, actually. Uh, Your Honor, I would offer Defendant's Exhibit 271. No objection. Very well. 271 is submitted. <clears throat> now, this poll on the um, first and second page talks about a question that was asked during the last presidential election. Correct, sir? Reading the question now. Okay, I have the question here. Yes. And people were asked whether if their party nominated a well qualified person for president, would they vote for that person? if that person had certain characteristics, correct? Yes. And, um, and respondents, 95% of them said that if a qualified Catholic was uh, nominated, they would vote for them, correct? That's what the poll says, yes. And do you have any reason to doubt those results? No. And the poll says that if a African American was nominated, who was well qualified, 94% would vote for him or her, correct? Yes, I see that figure. And 92% um, uh, would vote for a qualified uh, Jewish candidate, and 88% would vote for a qualified woman candidate, correct? I see those figures, yes, correct. And 87% would vote for a qualified Hispanic candidate, correct? I see that, yes. And 72% would vote for a qualified Mormon candidate, correct? Uh, yes, I see that. 67% would vote for a qualified candidate who had been married for the third time, correct? <laughs> That's what the poll says. 57% uh, uh, would vote for somebody who was 72 years of age if he was well qualified, correct? Yes. But only 55% would vote for a well-qualified person who is a homosexual. Correct, sir? Uh, yes, it's very close to the 72-year-old person. Um, yes, and um, uh, 40 points below a Catholic, right? According to this poll, yes. Um, and 39% below a black or African-American, correct? Yes, and 10% above an atheist. Yes. So does that tell you something about the extent to which there's discrimination and stereotyping and prejudice against homosexuals in this country? Uh, yes or no, it's, sir? It's a data point. 
It's a data point. That, that a yes? It's, it tells me something. It's one data point. I would want to investigate further, certainly. You, you don't have any reason to doubt the results of these? Well, I haven't looked, it, at, the, I haven't looked at the methodology, but um, I don't have any reason to doubt the findings. And in your investigation of whether there was prejudice against gays and lesbians and whether gays and lesbians had political power, did you investigate polls like this? Uh, I did look at some polls, yes. Um, let me turn back to the subject of initiatives um, and ask you to look at tab 84. <clears throat> And you said that one of the things that you had looked at were materials from the Human Rights Campaign. Am I correct about that? That's correct. And uh, this is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2859. Is that correct? Yes. And did you look at this document from the Human Rights Campaign? Um, let me take a look. I may have. I, I don't recall. Uh, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2859. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. 2859 is admitted. <clears throat> uh, let me ask you to look at page 5, first paragraph. <clears throat> it says there, A fundamental American value holds that people who do their jobs, pay their taxes, and contribute to their communities should not be singled out for unfair discrimination. But federal law fails to extend this basic fairness to untold millions of Americans across this country who happen to be lesbian or gay. They are fired from their jobs, refused work, paid less, and otherwise discriminated against in the workplace with no protection under federal law. Do you see that, sir? Yes, I do. Uh, do you have any reason to disagree with that? Let me take another look at it, please. The last sentence beginning with they, I have no idea what they mean with respect, or the author means with respect to how many. The prior sentence says that untold millions across this country who happen to be lesbian or, or gay are not covered by federal law uh, for employment uh, discrimination. That's currently the case, um, at least until the uh, ENDA law is passed by Congress, if so. But um, there's no indication from this paragraph as uh, to how many are fired from their job on the basis of their sexual orientation. Okay, let's break that up, sir. Okay. First, you do agree that there are some gays and lesbians who are fired from their jobs, refused work, paid less, and otherwise discriminated against in the workplace because of their sexual orientation. You would agree with that, correct? I have uh, no reason to disagree with that. I expect that's the case, yes. Well, not only do you expect that is the case, but in the term of your investigation, of gay and lesbian discrimination and political power. You have found out that that's the case, correct? Well, I'm aware that there are lawsuits, um, uh, anti-discrimination suits in many, in many states. And so on that basis, I can say that it is the case that there is discrimination um, on the basis of sexual orientation in the workplace. And have you investigated how many gays and lesbians are fired from their jobs, refused work, paid less, and otherwise discriminated against in the workplace simply because they're gay or lesbian? Have you investigated that? The, the total number? No, I have not. The approximate number? Have you looked at that? No, I have not. Have you tried to find out whether that number is large or small? Um, 
Uh, I assume it's a, a substantial number. I haven't looked at the specific numbers. Okay? Um, let me ask you to turn to the next page. <coughs> First paragraph says, anti-gay discrimination in the American workplace knows few bounds. As the 130-plus cases presented here show, anti-gay discrimination occurs in every region of the country, in large cities and small towns, on factory floors, and in restaurant dining rooms. Do you see that? I see that, yes. Then the first sentence of the next paragraph. Anti-gay discrimination often means enduring daily harassment, including name-calling, humiliation, and physical threats from coworkers and bosses alike. Do you see that? I do. And um, based on the work that you've done investigating discrimination against gays and lesbians and their political power, did you find that anti-gay discrimination often means enduring daily harassment, including name-calling, humiliation, and physical threats from coworkers and bosses alike? I have no reason to doubt that. Okay. Let me um, ask you next to look at tab 30. This is Plaintiff's Exhibit 874 and is a publication of the California Safe Schools Coalition. Um, have you seen this document before? Um, I may have. I don't recall it, actually. Your Honor, I would offer a plaintiff's exhibit 874. No objection, Your Honor. Well, 874 is in. Um, are you familiar with the California Safe Schools Coalition, sir? Uh, I actually don't uh, recall learning anything about that coalition. Uh, are you familiar with the 4-H Center for Youth Development at the University of California, Davis? Um, again, I don't recall that organization. This says it's a summary fact sheet from a report by the California Safe Schools Coalition and the 4-H Center for Youth Development at the University of California, Davis. Do you see that? Uh, can you direct me to where that is? I'm sorry. Right at the top. 34, tab 34. Tab 30. You have tab 30? I do. So I didn't have that in front of me before. Okay. But. And, and this is this is a uh, publication from the California Safe Schools Coalition, correct? Correct. Um, and um, I know that you've said that you don't remember whether or not you've seen this before, but let me direct your attention on the first page under key findings. Yes. And the... Um, First one says, harassment and bullying based on actual or perceived sexual orientation are pervasive. See that? I see that sentence, yeah. And the next sentence says, 7.5% of California students reported being harassed on the basis of actual or perceived sexual orientation. That translates to over 200,000 middle school and high school students harassed every year. You see that? I do. Uh, do you have any reason to disagree with that? I don't have any basis for knowing one way or the other. Did you investigate that uh, as part I, of what you did? In terms of harassment in schools? Yes. No, I did not. Um, uh, the next sentence says, harassment based on actual or perceived sexual orientation has dangerous consequences for students. Do you see that? I do. Do you have any reason to disagree with that? No. Okay. Um, let me now turn to um, 
tab 89. And you'll recall that this is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2864, which was a meekest brief submitted by Professors Estridge and Kane, who you've previously identified. Yes. Um, and I'd like to direct your attention to page 17. And I want to direct your attention to the uh, material at the very top of page 17. Um, uh, take a moment, though, to familiarize yourself with the context. And when you've, when you've finished, uh, let me know. Okay, I've read the paragraph. Okay. And the portion that I'm interested in is at the top of page 17, where Professors Estridge and Kane say, many prejudiced voters favor any measure that harms or excludes lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, or transgendered persons. And even moderate voters are reluctant because of the anti-gay stereotypes, for example, quote, predatory homosexuals, close quote, who, quote, recruit, close quote, vulnerable children and destroy traditional families, that the state long built into its public education and state policy. You see that? I do. Um, do you have any reason to doubt that? That's, that's a compound sentence, so I'd like to break it down. Um, okay, well, let's, let's take it piece by piece. First, do you believe that there are anti-gay stereotypes um, that relate to gays being, quote, predatory homosexuals who, quote, recruit vulnerable children. I know at least at some time there has been these stereotypes. I don't know the extent to which. So I believe that those stereotypes do exist, yes. And have you investigated the extent to which those stereotypes exist? Uh, no, I have not. Um, and is there also an anti-gay stereotype that uh, homosexuals will destroy traditional families. In your view, sir. Well, I, I yeah. I, I'm I, just asking for your view. Oh, I, I understand. Um, This is a little bit different than the, the first one, it seems to me. Um, Simple question. Do you well, believe, do you, based well, on the investigation right. that you have done, do you believe? I believe there's a view that um, homosexuals may uh, certainly undermine traditional families. Okay. Now, do you believe that those anti-gay stereotypes that you've just identified affect some voters and affected some voters who voted in favor of Proposition 8? Yes. Let me go oh. back. Let me go back. Um, I didn't say that. I don't think I said the second one was a, a stereotype. 
I think the sec uh, I said I said the second one was there's a view that homosexuals will undermine if if there's if certain um, uh, events occur with respect to uh, the recognition of same-sex marriage that that would undermine traditional families. You there's believe? Do you believe, sir, that um, there's a stereotype leaving leaving same-sex marriage aside? Okay. I just don't want to conflate. Leaving same-sex marriage aside. I just listen to, to the question, please, sir. Okay. I you believe that leaving same-sex marriage aside, there is a stereotype, using stereotype in the word way that you've used that term, okay, that homosexuals undermine traditional families. I just don't want to conflate the two. Nobody's asking you to conflate the two. I'm asking a simple question. About, about same-sex marriage? And, uh, no, not about same-sex marriage. I said leaving same-sex marriage aside. Okay, leaving same-sex marriage aside. Do you believe that there's an anti-gay stereotype that homosexuals undermine traditional families, even if we didn't have a same-sex marriage issue? Based on your investigation, do you believe that? You don't know. Um, okay, let's, le let, let's deal with the anti-gay stereotype that you do know. Uh, the stereotype that there are predatory homosexuals who recruit vulnerable children. Yes. Uh, do you think that led somebody, some buddies, some people, some number of people to vote for Proposition 8? Possibly so. Possibly so, sir. Again, when, when we talk about the polls on Proposition 8... I'm, I'm not asking for the polls. I'm asking for your opinion as an expert. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. You came in here saying that you were an expert and that you had done a study of gay and lesbian uh, political power and discrimination against gays and lesbians and whether that was occurring. Correct? Yes. Now, in connection with that, did you reach a conclusion as to whether anti-gay stereotypes, including the anti-gay stereotypes that there were predatory homosexuals recruiting vulnerable children, affected some of the voters who voted in favor of Proposition 8? My view is that at least some people voted for Proposition 8 on the basis of anti-gay stereotypes and prejudice. Okay. Now, what proportion of the people who voted for Proposition 8 did so based on anti-gay stereotypes and prejudice. That's what I cannot tell you. And I've seen no poll that would, would give me that information. Have you done uh, any investigation that would permit you to make any kind of approximation of that? No, and I don't know anyone who has. Okay. Um, let me ask you now to turn to tab 82. And this is the chapter in the book, Dangerous Democracy, <clears throat> that you and Professor Kane wrote. Yes. Uh, and let me ask you to look first at page 50. <clears throat> and under the heading, Minority Rights. Yes. Right one also can expect the initiative process to produce different outcomes than the legislative process will in the areas of protecting minority rights and promoting minority interests. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Then you identify uh, several reasons why that is so, correct? Take a minute to read this. <clears throat>
Okay. Uh, now, if you'd um, turn to page 52, I'm going to ask you about the first full paragraph there. Yes. And this refers to a study that you did of what you referred to as three high-use initiative states, Oregon, Colorado, and California, correct? Yes. And this was a study that covered the prior 40 years, correct? Uh, yes, this was a 1999 um, study I did. And it covered the 40 years preceding 1999, correct? 1960 to 99, something like that, yes. 39 years. Okay. Uh, you describe it as covering the past four decades, correct? That's correct. Um, and let me direct your attention to the middle of that paragraph where you say the problem, however, see that? Yes. The problem, however, you write, is that initiatives that directly and differentially affect minorities can easily tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment in the electorate. The initiatives from the three states in this category Carry on, Mr. Boyce. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, uh, you write, the problem, however, is that initiatives that directly and differentially affect minorities can easily tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment in the electorate. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Then go on to say, the initiatives from the three states in this category sought to ban state efforts to prevent, quote, private, close quote, racial discrimination in housing, restrict busing to desegregate public schools, restrict state efforts to protect the rights of homosexuals, establish English as the state's official language, restrict illegal immigration, ban state affirmative action for women and minorities, and restrict bilingual education. And was that an accurate description of the initiatives that you had studied? Uh, yes. Also, I also said, though, that these initiatives should not be too easily caricatured as majority efforts to tyrannize minorities. Well, uh, let's just look at that. What you said, um, <laughs> uh, you did have, that was not a complete sentence, was it? Yeah, you there's a comment after that, no. although some pose that danger, right? Yes, exactly. Right? Uh, you said these initiatives should not be too easily caricatured as majority efforts to tyrannize minorities, although many of them at least presented that danger. Correct, sir? That's what the sentence says, yes. And, and after that, you wrote what we just <laughs> described, correct? Uh, Problem, however, no, there's, is that there's initiatives an, there's that directly and differentially affect minorities <laughs> can easily tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment in the electorate. You wrote that, correct? There's an intervening sentence. Yes, there is. Um, you wrote the problem, however, is that initiatives, et cetera, correct? And then you give some examples of that. Am I correct? Uh, before that, I wrote some of the measures, e.g. shifting from a policy of bilingual education to English immersion, arguably re re represented bona fide, if controversial, efforts to promote the interests of minorities and enjoyed some support in effective, if affected minority communities. Yes, and immediately after that, what you say is that some of the measures represented that, and then you went on to say the problem, however, and you were talking about the problem with these initiatives, correct, sir? Yes, I'm wrestling with this question in this paragraph, yes. Um, well, it was your paragraph, correct? It was. Okay. Um, well, it was, it was mine. It was, I, I was a co-author. I can't claim it all myself. 
No, but you don't, you, you don't reject this, do you, sir? I do now. You do now, yes. I'm testifying as an expert for the defendants. You do now. No. But, but, in, but in my book of, that I published last year, I have a different analysis of this issue. In your book, you never said this was wrong, did you, sir? The book you published in 2009, you never said this was wrong. It's a to it's totally different analysis of this issue. You never said this was wrong. Yes or no? Did you ever say this was wrong? Did I ever say that this prior paragraph was wrong in yes. the book? No, I wrote it. I, I said it, I gave it Did different Did you ever analysis. say it was wrong? That's a yes or no question. Not in those words, no. Did you ever say it was inaccurate? Not in those words. Um, now, I'm just asking now for your present view, okay? You were describing in this paragraph a four-decade study of initiatives in three high-use initiative states. Do you believe that your description here is inaccurate as far as that study was concerned? I think I would cast it somewhat differently. I'm sure you would, but that's not my question. Okay? You were purporting here yes. to describe the results of a survey that you did, correct? That's correct. You believe that you described the results of the survey that you did accurately? I think incompletely. Incompletely. Um, well, let's, let's, uh, um, let's take it one step at a time. Um, when you say the problem is that initiatives directly and differentially or can directly and differentially affect minorities, do you believe that that is true? That is? I, yes, I do. Okay. And you believe that initiatives that directly and differentially affect minorities can easily tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment in the electorate. Do you believe that? I think on occasion that can occur. Okay. And do you believe that that has occurred? I do. Okay. Um, and is it the case that you still believe that the initiatives that you studied in this category, and, and, and let me ask you, when you say the initiatives from the three states in this category, you're talking about the category of initiatives that directly and differentially affect minorities and that tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment in the electorate, correct? Okay. And you give examples of initiatives that directly and differentially affect minorities that tap into a strain of anti-minority sentiment, correct, sir? Yes, that's correct. And the initiative examples that you give of that kind include initiatives to restrict state efforts to protect the rights of homosexuals, correct? Among several others, yes. Yes, among several others. I, I didn't in any way mean to uh, imply that was the only um, minority that was suffering here. Um, you then go on um, to say, by contrast, no voter-approved initiatives in those states during that period of 40 years expressly expanded the rights of minorities. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Is that an accurate statement, sir? Uh, I, I don't have any reason to disagree with that at this point, no. Okay. Um, let me ask you to um, look at page 42. <clears throat> And um, let me ask you to look at the very last sentence there, where you write, initiative government leads to a higher level of policy responsiveness to the median statewide voters, but it produces biases against individual and minority rights, precisely what the checks and balances system was meant That. Yes, I do. Um, what 
when you refer there to the median statewide voters, what are you referring to? If this is a political science term. If you look at the, um, the electorate and you look at the opinion, the public opinion of the electorate on a distribution, the median is um, the, uh, basically the, the opinion in the, in the center of that curve. Um, let's, let's look uh, next at tab 35. And this is your Santa Clara Law Review article, correct? It's already in evidence. It is, Your Honor. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, it is. And, um, and I'd like to ask you about some passages here that relate to the same subject that we were talking about, which is the relationship of initiatives to um, undermining protections for minorities. And I'd like to begin on page 8. In the first um, full paragraph, the uh, next to last sentence is what I'm primarily interested in. Um, but for context, um, the immediately preceding sentence says, first, the process of populist-oriented initiative lawmaking is not necessarily, quote, more democratic, close quote, than the representative system if one conceives of, quote, democracy, close quote, as not just, quote, majority rule, close quote, but instead a process that includes a range of democratic norms. You then go on to say, second, the substance of populist-oriented initiative lawmaking tends to undermine representative government and impose majoritarian values at the expense of minority rights. You see that? I see that. What did you mean in that sentence by majoritarian values? Uh, I assume what I meant was the, the viewpoint of uh, the majority of the voters um, participating in the election. Uh, let me ask you to look next at page 12 of this article. Bottom of the page. Yes. Where you write, quote, all of these consequences of the populist triumph, double dash, the threats to minority rights, the pressure on the courts, and the undermining of representative government, double dash, are disturbing to commentators from a range of political persuasions who admire the progressive conception of state government. And when you referred to commentators from a range of political persuasions, did you have any particular commentators in mind? Uh, let me think. Certainly most critics of the initiative process today come from the left. Early on in the progressive era, most critics of the initiative process came from the right. For example, William Howard Taft was an early critic of the initiative process. And this is what I've called the Madisonian kind of critique of the initiative process, and this was the framework I was using during this period. Indeed, if you... Um Turn to page 33 of your article. Let's see. Bottom of the page. That footnote 65. Um, you write, quote, direct democracy's threat to minority rights is, of course, one of the primary reasons Madison and most of the other founders favored a representative system replete with checks and balances. 
See generally James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, the Federalist Papers. And that's what you were referring to a moment ago when you talked about the Madisonian um, uh, analysis that you were pursuing at this time. Is that correct? Usually focused on um, the Federalist Papers, um, and that's the Madisonian analysis I was using as a critique critique to pure or direct democracy and the disadvantages of that system during that period of my, um, when I was in graduate school, yes. Uh, are you familiar with the Federalist Society? Uh, yes, I am. And would you consider the Federalist Society, um, in your terms, a left organization? No. Okay. You'd consider it a right organization, correct? In the left-right spectrum. I don't know if I'm the real expert on that in the courtroom, but uh, I, I would say probably so. Okay. Um, um, now let me ask you to um, look uh, at page 11 of this article. I'm interested in the... Um, third sentence of the first full paragraph there, but just so that you have the context, I'll read the first two sentences. You write, with respect to the second substantive concern, minority rights, it is clear that the direct initiative can be and has been used to disadvantage minorities. The checks and balances system of representative government is designed to harmonize Minority rule with protection of minor minority rights. I think you meant majority rule with minority rights. I did, and uh, let me just read that to be clear. <clears throat> um, and, and let me take them one sentence at, at a time. First, you write, with respect to the second subject of concern, minority rights, it is clear that the direct initiative can be and has been used to disadvantage minorities. That's what you wrote, correct? That's correct. And you believe that today, correct, sir? I do. And then you next write, the checks and balances system of representative government is designed to harmonize majority rule with protection of minority rights. And you wrote that at the time, correct? And you believe that today, correct? Yes, I do. Um, you then write, in contrast, the direct initiative system by bypassing checks and balances is weighted heavily towards majority rule at the expense of certain minorities, racial minorities, illegal immigrants, homosexuals, and criminal defendants have been exposed the, to the electorate's momentary passions as Californians have adopted a large number of initiatives that represent populist backlash against representative governments' efforts to protect or promote the interests of racial or other minorities. Do you see that? I do. And after your reference to homosexuals in that statement, you have a footnote 68, correct? Yes, I do. Now, if you turn to page 34, you'll see footnote 68. And you say the recent example is Proposition 22 of 2000. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, was Proposition 22 of 2000, were you saying here that Proposition 22 of 2000 was an example of the direct initiative system bypassing checks and balances at the expense of certain minorities? Is that what you were saying here, sir? That's what the footnote um, indicates. Okay. Now let me but ask you the, to look the at your deposition. The footnote and, is factually incorrect, however. Anyway. It says that Proposition 22 constitutionalizes the state ban on same-sex marriages, which it did not. Right. So I would say that the, the footnote is both factually and analytically incorrect. Well, um, uh, let me just be sure I understand what you're saying. Um, obviously, Proposition 22 is a statutory, That's not a constitutional thing. And you got that wrong, you're saying. I did. Okay. But nevertheless, regardless of whether you got wrong, whether it was a statute or a constitutional amendment, 
what you were saying here is that Proposition 22 was an example of the direct initiative system bypassing checks and balances at the expense of certain minorities, in this case, the homosexual minority. That's what you were saying here. Correct, sir? That's what I wrote at the time. That's okay. I, I no longer believe that. You no longer believe that. Well, sir, let's see about that. Look at um, your deposition, page 162. It's at tab one. Page 162, lines 22 to 25. Now first, your deposition taken in December of 2009, correct? Yes. Um, and this was after you wrote your book, correct, sir? Yes. Your most recent book, the one you were referring to. Yes. Um, and you were asked, question, do you agree that the direct initiative can be and has been used to disadvantage minorities? Answer, I believe that's a fair interpretation of the history of the initiative process. Did you give that testimony under oath on December 9, 2009? Yes, and I would say the same thing today. Thank you. Now, let me ask you to turn to tab 80. And this is a article that you wrote in the Seattle University Law Review that is plaintiff's exhibit 2855, correct, sir? Tab 80, 80. <coughs> Um, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2855. 2855. Oh, okay. No objection. Very well. 2855. Um, 80. Should be. 2855 is in. Um, uh, let me ask you to look at the bottom of page 6. Um, and here you write, at times government efforts to assist minorities have stirred resentment, which in turn has fueled counter efforts to reestablish and reinforce majoritarian interests. At the state level, the initiative process has provided a convenient vehicle for repealing or preempting representative government's efforts to assist minorities. In some states, such as California and Colorado, Voters have approved a steady stream of such initiatives in recent decades, nearly all of which have been challenged in court. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And was that based in part on the four-decade study of initiatives in Oregon, Colorado, and California that you have referred to previously? Yes. Next paragraph. Um, uh, I'm primarily interested in the third sentence, but if you wish, I can read the first two sentences for context. Um, the third sentence says, in the American system, courts have long assumed responsibility for protecting racial and certain other discrete and insular minorities, especially when prejudice against them tends seriously to curtail the operation of those political processes ordinarily to be relied on to protect minorities. You see that? Yes. And you go on to say, when an initiative affects a minority thus protected, it is predictable that after the election, the measure's opponents will petition the courts to strike it down. This conflict between the initiative system's tendency to produce measures directed at protected minorities 
and the Court's commitment to strictly scrutinize such measures naturally generates litigation. You see that? Yes, I do. Now, when you referred to the operation of those political processes ordinarily to be relied on to protect minorities, do you see that? Um, it's in the sentence where you yep. say, in the American system, courts have long assumed responsibility for protecting racial and certain other discrete and insular minorities, especially when prejudice against them tends seriously to curtail the operation of those political processes ordinarily to be relied on to protect those minorities. Do you see that? First question yes. is, do you see where I would... Where yes, I'm, I do. Okay, now, my question is when you refer to those political processes ordinarily to be relied on to protect minorities, what political processes are you referring to? Um, my, my understanding of this quote coming from, as I recall... Uh, this quote that you wrote. Yeah, I'm quoting somebody else, though, which is Justice Stone. Well, um, you have... You have um, I believe we included a quote from Justice Stone within your sentence, correct? Right, that's correct. Okay. Now, what is your understanding of those political processes ordinarily to be relied on to protect minorities? He's referring to the democratic um, processes. Which democratic processes? Legislatures. Um, that's, I, I think that's what he's referring to is the legislative process. Okay. Um, uh, now let me ask you to look at um, tab 35. Particular page 12. <clears throat> and was it was it accurate in 2001 to say that in California over the past four decades? I'm sorry. Can you direct me to where you're? Uh, I, I, I find the sentence, yeah. California, over the past four decades, approximately two-thirds of all voter initiative, voter-approved initiatives have been challenged in court, and of those, nearly half have been invalidated in part or in their entirety. Was that an accurate statement, sir? No, many of those didn't involve minority rights issues, but that's an accurate statement. Well, let's go on to what you write here. You say, in California and other states, challenge and invalidation inv rates vary by subject matter, correct? That's correct. Okay, which is the point you just made, that some of these related to minority rights and some didn't. You then go on to say, populist-oriented initiatives that affect unpopular minority or undermine representative government are frequently challenged and sometimes invalidated, correct? That's correct. And then you say, by contrast, initiatives that seek to protect the environment, a fairly common initiative type, rarely face trouble in the courts. Correct? Correct. Now let me ask you to look at tab 80. The Adel Law Review article again, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2855. And I'd like you to look at page 7. And okay, we're at tab 80. Tab 80, page 7, and this is a, a passage that we've already looked at, but I want to ask you another question in the context of what I've just been examining. Um, the very last sentence um, above the heading criminal justice initiatives you write, this conflict between the initiative system's tendency to produce measures directed at protected minorities and the court's commitment to strictly scrutinize such measures naturally generates litigation. Do you see that? 
Yes. And had you made a study of the extent to which initiatives directed at protected minorities had, in fact, been litigated? Uh, yes. Based on that study, you believe that that statement was correct? True? Yes. yes. And you believe that statement is correct today, correct? Frequent litigation, yes. In terms of directed at, I'm not sure that I would use that terminology, but um, affecting, certainly. Um, uh, now, um, let me ask you to look at tab 82. And this, this is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2857. It is your chapter in the book, Dangerous Democracy. And for present purposes, I want to start at page 53. And uh, it's the sentence is right above your heading initiative politics in the courts. Um, and you ask a question there. You ask, quote, what prevents initiatives from unfairly undermining individual rights and altering the constitutional structure of government? You see that? Yes. And you answer the courts, correct? I do. And would that still be your view? I believe that the courts have an important role in checking the initiative system. And um, my, my view has broadened beyond this, but that statement I um, believe is true. Um, and indeed, when you have a initiative that's a constitutional amendment, only the courts can prevent that initiative from unfairly undermining individual rights, correct? Unless it's repealed. Yes. Um, while we're on page 53, um, going down under the um, heading Judicial Review and the Counter-Majoritarian Difficulty, uh, the third sentence, you say, in exercising ju judicial review, the court's responsibility is to check majority actions that run counter to constitutional principles, including individual rights, especially those of unpopular minorities. Do you see that? Yes. And uh, as a political scientist, you would agree with that statement today, correct, sir? Yeah, I think there's a difference between protecting rights and expanding rights, which is where I get into my um, the now how the, the shift in the analysis. But if there's an established right and it's being violated by the initiative process, then I think the courts have a responsibility for checking that. And um, uh, when Proposition Eight was passed, gays and lesbians had the right in California to marry. Correct, sir? That's a yes or no question. Or you could say, I don't know. <laughs> but it's yes, no, or I don't know. Tested question. There was a, a pending ballot um, um, initiative before the At court. At the time that Proposition 8 was passed, in the months of July and August, September and October 2008, that gays and lesbians have the right to marry in California, in your opinion, Dr. Miller, yes, no, or I don't know. The court had issued a decision, and they had a right to marry, yes. So the answer to my question is yes. Um, I'm sorry. <clears throat> yes, the court had, um, through that decision, created a right. Now, just as a matter of understanding your terminology, um, difference between protecting rights and expanding rights? Yes. Um, did Brown against Board of Education protect a right or expand a right, in your view? The 14th Amendment 
was My question, sir, is not what your analysis is, because we could go all day on some of this. My simple question, in your view, as a political scientist, did Brown against Board of Education protect a right or expand a right as you use those terms? Correctly interpreting the 14th Amendment and protecting the, uh, the right established in the 14th Amendment. So you believe that Brown against Board of Education was not expanding a right, it was protecting a right guaranteed by the 14th Amendment, correct? That's my view. Okay. Um, now let me um, ask you to look next at page 55. And I'm going to ask you about the paragraph at the bottom of the page. Um, and Did you say 55? A, um, uh, it's tab 82. Oh, I'm it's sorry. one we're looking at. It's page 55. Um, and the third sentence there says, quote, if the role of the courts in exercising judicial review is to act as a filter. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Boyes, I'm, I'm not sure where we're at. This is page 55. Page 55. Line. The, the bottom of the page, the last paragraph, the paragraph that begins the populist view. Okay, I have it. The, you know, it says the populist view that judges should be extra deferential to initiatives has much intuitive appeal. However, as Julian Yule noted, if one accepts the underlying rationale for judicial re review, this is in fact 180 degrees off the mark. Do you see that? I do. You then go on to write, if the role of the courts in exercising judicial review is to act as a filter to protect constitutional principles and minority rights against majoritarian attack, then the courts need to be more vigilant, not less, when reviewing initiatives. Do you see that? I do. And you then go on to give some reasons for that, correct? Yes. And um, one of the reasons, um, uh, number one, you say, in a representative system, the courts are but one of the many institutional checks on majority rule, whereas in the initiative process, the courts are the only institutional filter the check of first and last resort. You see that? Yes. And you then go on to say, as we have argued, it is easier for violations of minority rights or other constitutional norms to emerge from an otherwise unfiltered majoritarian process than in one in which there are multiple checks and balances. You see that? Yes. You believe that at the time, correct, sir? Uh, okay, this is compound now. We've got... All I'm asking you is whether you believed it when you wrote it. Which, which, which part? The, the paragraph or the, or, or the subparagraph one? Uh, all of it, sir. Okay. <laughs> Did you believe all of this paragraph at the time you wrote it? Uh, to an extent. This was a co-authored article. I understand, but you didn't, you, you didn't disagree with this, did you, at the time? I was exploring this idea. I'd read this article by Julian Ewell. Um, I wasn't quite sure whether there was merit to it, um, that the court should use extra. Um, you've asked me about the paragraph saying that the court should be more vigilant, not less, in reviewing initiatives. That was a, that's a view of some in the academy. Others have the opposite view that courts should be more deferential to initiatives. And um, I was exploring the view that they should be more um, uh, more exacting in their review. Sure. This, is, this is a little bit different than the situation where you say you saw the light and changed your mind. 
here I'm just asking about what you believed at the time you wrote this. You don't say here that you're exploring the issue, do you? Uh, no, I don't. No, and you, you don't say, maybe this is right, maybe this is wrong, I don't know. You, you say this pretty positively, don't yeah, you? I probably, I probably should have phrased it differently because I don't think I strongly held this view at any time. Um, I think the better view is that the court should exercise the same. In terms of, I mean, we can talk about sub one and those issues, but in terms of judicial review of initiatives, I think the better view is that initiatives should be treated the same as um, enactments of the legislature. Um, well, let's let's look at number one. Okay. Um, uh, the first sentence. In a representative system, the courts are but one of many institutional checks on majority rule. You would agree with that today, correct? Yes, I do. And then, whereas in the initiative process, the courts are the only institutional filter to check a first and last resort. And um, in California, at least, you would agree with that statement today, correct? Yes, I, I don't believe. Okay, if the answer is yes, we don't have to go into more. Well, in terms of actually um, defeating the initiative institutionally, I mean, there are filters in terms of the Attorney General's uh, uh, ballot and summary, and there are other institutional actors that have a role. Once as, the initiative is passed, once the initiative is passed, the only filter is the courts, correct? In California, at least. Unless the initiative by its own terms allows for legislative amendment or repeal. And Proposition 8 didn't do that, did it? Okay. Um, you then say in this article, it is easier for violation of minority rights or other constitutional norms to emerge from an otherwise unfiltered majoritarian process than one in which there are multiple checks and balances. Do you see that? Yes. Now, first, that is something that you did believe at this time, and you wrote it repeatedly in article after article at this time. Correct, sir? At that time, I believe that, yes. Okay. In terms of the standard of judicial review. That, Excuse me, what? In terms of the standard of judicial review in the preceding paragraph. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, sir, wait a minute. You say here, it is easier for violation of minority rights or other constitutional norms to emerge from an otherwise unfiltered majoritarian process than one in which there are multiple checks and balances. That's what you wrote here, correct? I'm not, I'm not contesting that. No. Okay, and, and you wrote the substance of that repeatedly, and we've shown you a number of examples of yes. that, correct? Yes. And you clearly believe that, correct? Okay. Um, let me ask you to look at uh, plaintiff's Exhibit uh, 2856. That's tab. Uh, I'm sorry, that's that's at tab 81, 81. <clears throat> and in particular, I want you to look at page 10. And this is an article, Anatomy of a Backlash, uh, written by you, correct, sir? And this is a conference paper, and it was never published. Um, this was uh, prepared for delivery um, at the 2005 annual meeting of the American Political Science Association, correct? Yes, I've, I've already testified about that. In fact, this was one of the articles you testified uh, about on direct examination, correct? Yes. Articles that you um, uh, were listing when you were being qualified as an expert, correct? Correct. Um, and um, on page 10, you say, um, and this is one, two, three, four. 11 lines from the bottom of the page. It's the sentence that begins, once this majority. Yes. Um, 
and the majority is referring to there is the majority that passes a um, initiative, correct? Yes. They quote, once this majority embeds its preference in the state constitution, neither the state legislature nor the state court can undo the provision. As a consequence, the federal courts provide the only institutional check on the new constitutional provision, correct? That's correct. And you believe that when you delivered this paper in 2005, correct? Yes. And you believe that today, correct? It depends on the institutional rules of the state. Sir, the state you're talking about here, um, and the whole state we're talking about uh, in, throughout this trial is California, correct? Right. right. So, uh, and, when, when we say and, the and legislature. You know, and you know that in California, once an initiative is passed, okay? Yeah. Right here, the federal courts provide the only institutional check on the new state constitutional provision. The legislature could put something back on the ballot, or the people could, to repeal it. It has to go back to the same majoritarian uh, group that passed it in the first place, correct? I'd, re I'd reject that. It's a different majority in every election. Um, different electorate in every election. Um, do the uh, prejudices and stereotypes of that electorate change, in your view? Yes. If you compare um, all the evidence over time, there's much less stereotyping and prejudice against many minority groups. And that's true for, in your view, all minority groups, correct? I believe so. I think, um, in particular, if you, if you want to look at this, Proposition 20, uh, two and two thousand. What was? Do you remember what my question was? Yes. What was my question? Maybe you should re re ask the question. Is it true of all minority groups? That. Uh, that in your view, stereotyping and prejudice is re has, being reduced. I'd have to look more closely at that, but in in general, I think we have less stereotyping and prejudice in the United States than we used to. But you recognize there are still stereotyping and prejudice against gays and lesbians today, correct? And I believe it's less than in the past. don't have any idea how many or what percentage of the voters in favor of Proposition 8 were motivated by stereotypes and prejudice, correct? Okay. Um, let me turn to the subject of um, hate crimes legislation. Um, you identified the federal hate crimes law, which you describe as the Mas Matthew Shepard law, um, as the example that you could come up with of a federal uh, law that demonstrated gay and lesbian political power. That was, one, that was one indice of it. Oh. Um, were there other federal laws that were passed that, in your view, demonstrate gay and lesbian political power? That's the one I examined. I, I can't think of any other. There have been executive orders Sir, and others. Do you understand the question? The question was about laws that were passed that you think demonstrate gay and lesbian political power? That's one I offered in my report, and I don't have Only any. one, correct? In terms of federal legislation coming out of Congress. All federal legislation comes out of Congress, correct? There's also federal regulations. All federal legislation comes out of Congress. And this is the only federal legislation that has been passed that you believe demonstrates the political power of gays and lesbians, correct? That was the only one I identified. It's the only one you know, correct? Now, um, do, you, do you know what the uh, formal name of that legislation was? Matthew Shepard Bill. Um, uh, actually, would it refresh your recollection if I told you it was the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd yes, Bill? Yes, that's, that's correct. You know who James Byrd was, don't you? Um, he was a victim of hate crime. 
and he was an African American, correct? And uh, this Matthew Shepard and James Byrd um, legislation was supported not only by gays and lesbians, but by the African American community and a wide variety of other uh, minorities, correct? African Americans were already protected under hate crimes legislation, though. This legislation was supported not only by gays and lesbians, but by the African American community as well, correct, sir? Coalition that supported this, that's correct. And indeed, this, les this legislation was something that was valuable not only to gays and lesbians, but to every citizen in this country, correct? I don't, I don't know what you mean by that. Don't you feel, as an individual citizen, that prohibiting hate crimes benefits you? Yes, I do. This was legislation that benefited every citizen in this country, correct? Particularly benefited those groups that are targeted for hate crimes. Yes, but it's also something that you believe, and the vast majority of Americans believe, benefits everybody, correct? In terms of good public policy, I think yes. many Americans believe that's a good thing to, to be able to protect victims of hate crime. Yes, and I I, I agree with that. Um, and incidentally, you're you're familiar with Megan's law, are you not? Yes, I am. And Megan's law was something that was adopted because Megan, who was a young girl, was kidnapped, raped, and killed. Correct. And um, uh, Megan's law enjoyed wide popular support, correct? That's true, yes. And you, you wouldn't view the passage of Megan's law as demonstrating the political power of children, would you? Or would you? Maybe you would. No, I mean, I, I think there was, there was a lot of concern about children, and uh, to the extent that that's manifest in uh, political mobilization and support for children's rights advocates. I mean, I, I, I would have to look close. I haven't actually examined it very closely. So you, you think this, this might have, Megan's Law might have been the result of the political power of little girls who were raped and killed? No, I think sympathetic allies. Sympathetic allies. That was exactly my, actually the point that I was trying to make. Um, when you have things like hate crimes, um, that is something that virtually all Americans believe ought to be adopted, correct? We ought to prohibit that. That's a widely held view in this country. It's a widely held view. When you get into the details, then there can be reasons for concern. Whether or not there are reasons for concern, you would agree that it is a very widely held view that we ought to prohibit hate crimes, regardless of what the minority is. That fighting is often about the details of what the legislation says, but there's a widely held view that we should um, criminalize hate crimes. Now, have you looked at hate crimes in your investigation? I haven't looked at it in depth, but I'm familiar with some statistics about hate crimes, yes. Uh, and where do those statistics come from? Uh, there's FBI um, statistics. I think I also looked at some from Los Angeles County. Um, well, let me show you some documents and see if this is what you look at. Um, let me ask you, and to move things along, let me ask you to look at tabs 12, 13, 14, and 15, which are respectively plaintiff's exhibits 491, 492, 493, and 494. And these are um, the hate crime statistics from the Uniform Crime Report of the United States Department of Justice uh, for the years 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2008. Sorry, can you tell me the uh, tabs again? The, tab the first tab. 12 through 15. Okay, thank you. Uh, and um, were these statistics that you looked at? I believe I've, I've reviewed these, yes. And you uh, discern from this 
that the second largest minority that was targeted by hate crimes were gays and lesbians? I need to refresh my memory by looking at the chart. Um. Let me begin with um, Exhibit 494, which is behind tab 15, which are the hate crime statistics for 2008 that were published November 23, 2009. Um, and what minority was most subject to violent hate crimes? If you know. Most? Yeah, let, 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 me, let me ask you, independent of these exhibits, no. um, uh, do you have uh, an opinion as to what minority is most subject to violent hate crimes? Um, I would guess that gays and lesbians are high um, racial minorities, and there's, I think those would be the two. Now, have you investigated that as part of your analysis? Not closely, no. Just, I, I've, I've reviewed some of these reports. Now, um, adjusting for percent of the population, do you have a judgment as to what minority is most subject to hate crimes generally? I would have to take a, a closer look at it. Not done that? Not in terms of per capita or um, of the population. It's also, again, as I said, difficult to know what the, the actual number of gays and lesbians in the population is. you have an estimate of that? I've only derived that from other people's estimates. Do you have an opinion on that? Not a, not a very well-formed one, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 5 percent, but it, it could go either direction. Um, Your Honor, I would offer plaintiff's exhibits 491, 492, 493, and 494. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Those exhibits will be admitted. Uh, now, you also said you thought you'd looked at some uh, statistics uh, for California or Los Angeles. Do you recall that? Yes. Uh, let me ask you to... Um, look at exhibits um, 675, which is behind tab 100, and exhibit 834, which is behind tab 92. These relate to hate crimes in California and um, uh, Los Angeles County, correct? <clears throat> Let's see. We're dealing with exhibit 675, which is behind tab 100, which is hate crime in California 2007. Tab 100? Tab 100. Um, Uh, maybe, perhaps it's, is it 102? Uh, 2007. Yeah. Yes, sir. I apologize. Um, tab 102? Tab 102. 102. 102. 2675. Eight crime in California, 2007. Right. And tab 92? Tab 92 should be hate crime report 2008 from Los Angeles County. Commission on Human Relations. I believe that it is, 834. Uh, I would offer exhibits 675 and 834. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. You're admitted. These documents that you reviewed? Um, I believe I've, I've uh, reviewed these, yes. Um, now, um, you described yesterday uh, all of the powerful, in your words, political allies that gays and lesbians had in California. Do you recall that? Yes. 
And nevertheless, you acknowledge that Proposition 8 passed, correct? I acknowledge that it passed. And uh, the reason it passed um, was because of religion, correct, sir? I don't know if I would agree with that. No. Okay. Uh, first, um, uh, let's um, let's go to your demonstrative number twenty-two. In this demonstrative that's going to be coming up, um, you talked about the uh, religions that supported gay and lesbian rights. You recall that generally? I recall that generally, yes. And um, uh, you didn't have a chart that described the religions that opposed gay and lesbian rights, did you? That's correct. This is a rebuttal report. Um, and. Um, on uh, tab or demonst 22, you talk about the California Council of Churches, and you say it represents um, denominations with more than 1.5 million members, correct? Yes. And then you list denominations, correct? Yes. Not an exhaustive list of their membership, but this, this is some of them. Now, it's also not a list of uh, churches that support gay marriage, is it? The organization to which the, Sir, the churches belong. Can, I, can I ask you to listen to the question? Yes. Do the churches that are listed here support gay marriage? Some of them do. And? All of them belong to an organization that promotes it. And? Some of them don't, correct, sir? Well, they're... They're still part of this organization, which is advocating on behalf of same-sex marriage. So it's hard to say that they don't support same-sex marriage. Professor Miller, these churches put out statements about what their position is with respect to same-sex marriage? National or international organizations do, yes. Did you look at those? You report, yes. And by looking at those, could you tell that some of the churches listed here do not support same-sex marriage? Or not? Some of the national, international organizations do not, on this list, do not. But obviously the local units of these organizations belong to, an organi belong to the California Council of Churches, which oppose Proposition 8. Um, do you belong to organizations that um, have views different than yours, that publish views different than yours? Okay. And so the mere fact that you're a member of an organization that has a view doesn't mean that you have that view, correct? That's correct. Okay. So the mere fact that these churches are members of the California Council of Churches doesn't mean that they have the same view on same-sex marriage as the... California Council of Churches, correct? My view is that many... Uh, no, no, I'm, please, just listen to the question. Remember the question? Why don't you restate it, please? The mere fact that these churches are members of the California Council of Churches does not mean that they share the opinion of the California Council of Churches on same-sex marriage, correct? The problem is the definition of church because local units of these churches may well support same-sex marriage, even though the national or international organ, um, hierarchy does not. Sure. That may or may not be so, as you just said. However, my question is, the California Council of Churches has a position on same-sex marriage. Supports it. Mere fact that these churches and denominations that you list here are members of the California Council of Churches does not mean that they support gay marriage, correct? Because you can be a member of an organization and not necessarily agree with every position that that organization takes, correct? Strongly disagree, you probably leave the organization. 
but I would agree that um, in at least some form with your statement, yes. Incidentally, you say there are 1.5 million members of denominations that belong to the California Council of Churches. Um, uh, how many uh, members of the Catholic Church are there in California? I don't know if I can recall off the top of my head. It's, I believe, the largest denomination in the state of California. The largest denomination. And um, does, it, um, does it have 30% of the electorate? That sounds about right. That 30% of the electorate identifies. Well, I'm not sure if it's the electorate. I think it's more the population. 30% of the population. Uh, what's 30? Well, and, and, and actually, you probably ought to use population because this is 1.5 million members. Um, it's not members of the electorate, it's members of the churches. So if we take a comparable number for, for Catholics, what's the comparable number? I, I'd, I'd have to check. I don't Approximately, know. sir. third of 36 million. Um, 12 million. 12 million, maybe. So 1.5 million members of the California Council of Churches, 12 million uh, members of the Catholic Church, correct? Yes, and I, I should say for both of these, these numbers are um, contested because um, there's difficulty in estimating membership, church membership. Different denominations measure by different means, either by church attendance or by um, the individual self-identification. And so with that caveat, I think it's, it's fair to say that there are more Catholics in, um, in California than members of these organizations. It's contested. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not approximately 30% of California's population identify as Roman Catholics? I think identify. I don't know how closely they're connected to the church, whether they attend worship services or... Um, but I think about a, th a third identify as Catholic. And um, what is the next largest um, religious group in California? Category? Yes. Okay. Again, based on, I believe, Pew Research studies, they identify evangelicals as the second largest um, group. And evangelicals is a broad category. It's not a hierarchy like the um, Roman Catholic Church. And what percentage of um, Californians identify as evangelicals? I think in these studies, again, where the figures are not totally clear. Whether no, no I'm asking for your opinion. My opinion. In your opinion. With the caveats I've given about the difficulty of measurement, I would say about 20%. That's your best judgment? My best judgment. Okay. So we've got 30%. Catholic and 20% evangelical, correct? The population. Uh, and um, uh, that would, uh, if, you take 30, if you take your 36 million for the population of California, that's 18 million people, right? More or less. Um, now, you know what the position is of the Catholic Church with respect to same-sex marriage and homosexuality, correct? Yes, I do. Now, the Catholic Church um, condemns homosexual acts as a serious depravity, correct? Um, I don't know if I've seen that specific statement. I know they have dis they disapprove. Let me ask you to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 770 behind tab 22. Second page, last paragraph. Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 770. No objection, Your Honor. 770 is admitted. See at the bottom it says, Sacred Scripture condemns homosexual acts, quote, as a serious depravity, close quote. I'm trying to see the context of the quote. 
Thank you. If you have the context of that quote, let me know. <coughs> My understanding of the Catholic Church's position is that there's a balance between moral disapproval of homosexual activities and desire to respect um, the dignity of the individual, which is on the, the next page. But we're talking here about homosexual acts, correct? Uh, yes, I just want to clarify. Yes. That and homosexual a acts, the Catholic Church takes the position that those are a serious depravity, correct? Church, it says sacred scripture condemns homosexual acts as, quote, a serious depravity. Do you have any doubt that that's the position of the Catholic Church? No. Okay. Did you know that before I just showed you this? I knew that the Catholic Church morally disapproved of homosexual acts, yes. Um, now, you said that evangelicals were a collection of churches, correct? What's the largest church in California after the Catholic Church? Not sure. You mean evangelicals generally, or? Oh, but evangelicals will include more than one church, correct? Yes. There are more than one church that many you describe within the umbrella of evangelicals. Many of them are independent churches that don't have an um, ecclesiastical hierarchy of any kind. Our churches that are evangelical that do have a hierarchy, correct? And this is a difficult um, area for def of definition because within some of these traditional, um, I'm trying to explain uh, why it's difficult for me to answer that question. Let me, let me try to ask, ask a question that maybe you can answer. Is it true that the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest single church in California after the Roman Catholic Church? Actually, I don't know that. I believe that's true in the, in, in the United States, but I'm not sure about in California. Have you investigated that? I may have looked at it, but I can't recall. Okay. Um, now, you know what the view of the Southern Baptist Convention is with respect to homosexual behavior, correct? Yes. That is that it's an abomination and shameful, correct? Uh, I knew that they morally disapproved. I didn't know about those terms. Um, let me ask you to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit 771, which is behind tab 23, and which I would offer. No, no objection, Your Honor. 771 is admitted. Um, and the third paragraph where it says, the Bible clearly teaches that homosexual behavior is an abomination and shameful before God. Do you see that? I see that sentence, yes. Um, uh, now, did you investigate the position of religions other than evangelicals and Roman Catholics um, and the California Council of Churches with respect to Proposition 8? Yes, I did. Um, and what, um, what religious groups did you investigate? I believe I looked at uh, Jewish um, traditions, various okay. the Jewish traditions on their positions on that, which were divided. Which was divided. Right. And the um, majority of uh, the Jewish community uh, supported Proposition 8 very strongly. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, got the, I have that reversed. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit tired. Um, the, uh, their position is that they favor same-sex marriage, the Jewish community in general, and a majority oppose Proposition 8. Um, now, um, did you investigate what the view of um, Orthodox uh, Judaism was? Yes. And uh, as well as Reform um, and Conservative Judaism. And uh, what was the uh, view of Orthodox Judaism? Orthodox Judaism um, opposed, uh, opposes uh, same-sex marriage. And in fact, Orthodox Ju Ju Judaism um, believes that homosexual acts 
like adulterous and incestuous behavior, are condemned in the law of Moses. Those who do these things, both men and women, are, according to God's law of the Old Covenant, to be put to death. Correct? That's the view of the Orthodox branch of Judaism. I don't recall that quote. Um, Look at um, tab 70, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2844, which I would offer. Well, um, 2844 is it? See the second paragraph on the first page where it says what I previously read. This is Orthodox Judaism. This looks like Orthodox Church. Maybe, maybe it is the Greek, uh, Your Honor. Um, I think you're right. I have my exhibits uh, backwards. But this is the, uh, th- that's a good question. Did you investigate um, the view of Orthodox Christianity? Uh, yes, I did. And is this the view of Orthodox Christianity? I believe I did. Um, is this the view of Orthodox Christianity? I don't recall. Um, well, um, uh, let me try to be sure I understand what you're saying. You investigated the views of Orthodox Christianity, correct? Yes. yes. <laughs> and uh, Orthodox Christianity is actually quite a large... Um, a religion in California, correct? Be, well, it's, there's, there's diversity within Orthodox Christianity, different national groups. There's Greek and Ro- Russian Orthodox, and I actually don't remember uh, their, their various views on this issue. Um, are you aware of any Orthodox Christianity group that promotes or favors same-sex marriage? All from that list from the California Council of Churches, there were Orthodox churches listed in that coalition. Those were individual churches, correct? I don't believe so. I think it was. Okay, let's go back to Demonstrative 22. Listed the Greek Orthodox Church as a member of the California Council of Churches, but you're not suggesting that the Greek Orthodox Church favors same-sex marriage, are you, sir? Or are you? I I guess I don't know. Are you or are you not? Again, they're part of a coalition that's. I understand they're part of a coalition or part of a California Council of Churches. My question is a very simple one: Does the Greek Orthodox Church favor same-sex marriage? Yes, no, I don't know. I don't know what the global Greek Orthodox Church's view on this is. Does the, do you believe that there is a Greek Orthodox Church in California that is separate from what you refer to as the global Greek Orthodox Church? Again, I don't know why. I'm just, or, yes, no, I don't know. I believe that there's um, local units of the Greek Orthodox Church, including one that would join the California Council of Churches. And does that local unit, as you describe it, um, Favor same-sex marriage? Yes, no, I don't recall, or I don't know, or I never knew. They're part of this coalition, they are. In terms of whether they would, um, as a matter of doctrine and practice, I don't know. And you keep referring to the California Council of Churches as a coalition. Um, uh, By that, do you mean that they have gotten together for the purpose of supporting same-sex marriage? That was a major part of their legislative agenda over the past couple of years, yes. Of the California Council of Churches? Yes. But the California Council of Churches does a lot of different things, right? I would assume so. I'm not intimately familiar with their, uh, their work. Um, Your Honor, let me... Um, 
try to speed this along. Um, uh, let me offer plaintiff's exhibits 2840, which are at tab 66, 2839, which are, is at tab 65, 2842, which is at tab 68, Um, those are all uh, various uh, statements by various religious groups. No objection. What was the last one? Uh, 2842, which is at tab 68. All right. There being no objection, 2840, 39, and 42 are admitted. As part of your work, uh, did you investigate the extent to which the groups favoring um, Proposition 8, the religious groups favoring Proposition 8, contributed far more in money and manpower than the groups opposing Proposition 8. Did you investigate that? I wasn't able to determine um, in a quantitative way, the monetary and organizational contributions of the progressive churches to the No on Eight campaign. I didn't have any access to um, the No on Eight campaign's internal um, documents to know about that. Um, I know a little bit more about uh, the religious contribution, religious organizations' contributions to the Yes on Eight campaign. Um, and and that's that's because you did have access to the yes on Proposition Eight campaign, correct? Yeah, I don't know the extent um, to the doc of the documents. I've seen some that would allow me to form some judgments on this, but I can't make a comparative judgment. Well, let me um, ask you to look at Plaintiff's Exhibit Twenty Five Fifty Two, which is behind Tab Ninety Six. Twenty-five fifty-two. This one of the documents that you um, had available to you. I, yeah, I believe so. I've seen this document. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit twenty-five fifty-two. Twenty-five fifty-two is submitted. And um, if you go to the second page. Um, the second paragraph that begins grassroots signatures. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, and um, uh, this is a uh, email from Mr. Prentice, correct? It appears to be so, yes. Um, and this says, the response from churches is larger than ever before experienced in California. More than 2,000 pastors have been addressed at events, and 300 churches have offered their staff and facilities as distribution centers for petitions. Do you see that? I do. And that's talking about the pastors and churches that are supporting Proposition 8, correct? It seems to be, yes. And that's the way you interpreted it when you reviewed this document, correct? Yes. Um, let me ask you to look, to look next at um, exhibit, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2561 behind tab 95. This one of the documents that you reviewed. Yes. Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2561. Subject to our standing objections, Your Honor, no objection. Very well. 2551 is admitted. And um, 
the last sentence of the first paragraph. Um, well, let me let me begin earlier than that. Um, uh, this is also an email from Mr. Prentice, correct? Yes. And it says, as you probably know, the LDS Church is sold out for the marriage amendment. The giving from the state's Mormons is topping six million dollars right now, with no signs of slowing down. You see that? Yes. And this is dated August 25, 2008, correct? Correct. Then the last sentence in that paragraph says, you may know that the Mormons have been out walking neighborhoods the last two Saturdays with about 20,000 total volunteers. I see that sentence, yes. And um, you didn't have any reason to uh, disagree with that sentence, did you? I, yeah, I don't have any personal knowledge, but I don't have any reason to disagree with that. Um, now, apparently, it takes massaging to get evangelicals to action, according to this. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> In that case, it may, it may not be that different from <laughs> the rest of us. Um, uh, now, you said that you could not make a comparative analysis as to whether the contribution of religious groups opposed to Proposition 8 were greater or lesser than the contributions of religious groups favoring Proposition 8. Is that correct? I, I can't make a quantitative um, uh, sort of ratio comparison. I think it would be fair to say that uh, the contribution of religious organizations in favor of Proposition 8 was larger than the uh, at least financial contributions, um, perhaps also organizational contributions uh, to the No on 8 campaign. But again, I haven't seen the internal documents of the No on 8 campaign. If I understand what you're saying, are you saying that it's your opinion that religious groups that favored Proposition 8 devoted substantially more time, money, volunteers than the religious groups opposed to Proposition 8. Objection compound. Objection overruled. Again, this is based mainly on media reports. I'm asking for your opinion. If you don't have an opinion, if you haven't looked at enough that would allow you as an expert to have an opinion, you can say so. Do you have an opinion on that? So uh, with the caveats about my inability to get some information on the other side, I do have an opinion, which is to say that, in my view, there was a larger contribution of money and organizational resources from religious groups to the Yes uh, on 8 campaign than to the No on 8 campaign. Do you have an opinion as to whether, in fact, the religious groups that favored Proposition 8 supplied most of the institutional support for Proposition 8? By institutional support, that would be... Um, Institutional support, a phrase that you use as a political science, sir? Yeah, I just want to make sure that we're... Well, let's, let, let's, let's first... You use that term, right? Yes. What do you mean by it when you use it? So in, a, in an initiative campaign, it could be um, financial... What is it, not what it could be? In Europe, when you use that term, what do you mean by it? Well, it depends on the campaign. It's different campaigns are run differently. But let's talk about Proposition 8, just to pick one out of the air. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. In Proposition 8, what did you mean by institutional support? Uh, so, so there would be a f fundraising. Fundraising? There would be um, organization of the uh, uh, sort of get out the vote, mobilizing voters. There would be um, professional campaign staff. There would be... Um, Probably attorneys involved in the uh, in the campaign. So this is what in, in the political science literature is sometimes called the 
um, initiative uh, sort of, um, uh, I guess, in institutional structures, supporter structures. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. And you believe that churches and religious organizations provided most of the institutional support for Proposition 8, correct? I don't know whether a lot of those people I just listed were churches and religious organizations. They were certainly... Let me ask you to look at tab 25, Plaintiff's Exhibit 796. Tab 25... Exhibit 796. Turn to page 55, please. <coughs> Second paragraph. Um, you say churches and religious organizations supplied most of Proposition 8's institutional support with Catholics, Evangelicals, and Mormons leading the way. Correct? Correct. <clears throat> um, and this is the article that you wrote in the French Journal that you referred to as your peer-reviewed article, correct? Correct. Um, and I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 796. Okay. 796 is admitted. And um, this was published in 2009, correct? Yes. And um, you then go on to say California's Roman Catholic bishops and many evangelical pastors, including in black churches, encourage parishioners to support the initiative through fin financial contributions and volunteer efforts. That? Yes. And... Um, you believe that all that is true, correct, sir? Yes, when I, I wrote this, I was relying on press reports, and that was my understanding. And I, nothing that I've learned since then is, contradicts that. Um, uh, you then go on to say that leaders of the Mormon Church organized a massive effort to support the initiative. You see that? Yes. You go on to say, while Mormons are only about 2% of California's population, Members of the church, both from California from, and from other states, provided critical financial contributions and volunteer supports. Yeah? Yes, I do. Um, and you believed that at the time, correct, and still do? Correct. Um, and even though you may not be an expert on the No on 8 campaign. Do you know enough about it to have an opinion as to whether the primary institutional support for the No on 8 campaign were churches and religious organizations? Uh, in terms of primary, I would say probably not. I mean, um, they, they were certainly part of the coalition, but the coalition was different on the No side than on the Yes side. What part of the support for the No on 8 campaign was provided by churches and religious organizations, sir? Certainly grassroots organizing. How much? What percentage? What percentage? I don't know. Again, Approximately. I have, I have no idea because I haven't seen that information. Um, now, you do know that Religion was critical in determining voter attitudes towards Proposition 8, correct? Uh, I believe religion was a factor for, for some voters, certainly. It was more than just a factor. It was critical in determining voter attitudes towards Proposition 8, correct? I think it was a critical factor for some, for some voters, yes. Well, sir, uh, let me ask you to look at uh, the next page in the article that you wrote in 2009. 
Um, the last paragraph on page 56. You say, Egan and Cheryl noted several factors, that several factors contributed to support for Proposition 8, including age, party identification, ideology, and religiosity. Do you see that? Yes, I do. You then go on to write, in particular, these researchers confirmed that religion was critical in determining voter attitudes towards Proposition 8. Do you see that? Yes. And you believe that at the time, correct, sir? I think what I probably meant to say was some voter attitudes, given that list that I just put above there about party identification, age, ideology, and religiosity being four factors. And I believe that religion was a critical factor for at least some voters, yes. You don't say at least some voters here, do you, sir? No, I don't. And um, uh, I don't think I ever believed that it was a critical factor for all voters. Um, and it was a critical factor for some, clearly. And did you believe that it was a critical factor in determining the election? That again, I don't know. That again, you don't know. Um, well, let me ask you to um, look back at page 47 of this article. Um, and for context, I want you to look at the sentences right at the top of the page, you know, where you say that many observers were mystified um, as to how California, who was in the forefront of same-sex marriage and civil rights for gays and lesbians, and who gave Obama such uh, an overwhelming majority and had so many Democrats, could have voted for Proposition 8. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and this is, this is the um, dilemma or conflict uh, that we talked about earlier of having all of these so-called powerful forces and allies that you say that gays and lesbians have in California, and yet confronting that with the passage of Proposition 8. We talked about that before. Now, you then answer that question, correct? You answer why and how this apparent contradiction can be explained, correct? I do. And you say the apparent contradiction can be explained by examining the religious characteristics of California's Democratic voters. Correct, sir? We'll agree with that, yes. Still agree with that? Yes. Okay. Among a number of factors. Oh, think... you don't say among a number of factors here, do you, sir? I do later. In the well, article. right here, you say the apparent contradiction can be explained by examining the religious characteristics of California's Democratic voters. That's what you say here, right? Dr. Miller. Let me, let, me find, let me find the quote. On page 47, remember at the top of the page, we went through the contradiction. Then you say, and it's, it's a one-sentence paragraph. Can you, you see it? Oh, one-sentence okay. paragraph. Got it. The apparent contradiction can be explained by examining the religious characteristics of California's Democratic voters. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay. And you believe that then and you believe it now, correct? Yes, I do. Religious characteristics it was an important factor in the election. Now, sir, you didn't say an important factor here, did you? I, I, I ask you, please look at this language. I do. Because I'm asking you, when you wrote this language, you clearly believed what you were writing in 2009, correct? Yes, I did. Now, since 2009, have you changed your mind? Um... I think this was an important, a critically important factor was the religious characteristics of Democratic voters. Okay. There were other factors in the election as well. Um, were there other critical factors? Um, I think there were a number of factors that motivated. Were there other critical factors? You used the word critical the factors. 
Again, we haven't seen polling on why people voted for Proposition All 8. I'm asking for is your opinion. You've I, come in here and as an expert, okay? Yes. And you wrote in 2009, just last year, that the apparent contradiction that we've been talking about can be explained by examining the religious characteristics of California's Democratic voters. Now, you then said you thought religious characteristics were a critical factor in determining how people voted. I said that just a moment ago. Remember that? Yes, I did. Now, what I'm asking you, in your opinion, were there any other critical factors in determining how people voted? Okay. Would you list those critical factors? Again, this is without the benefit of polling data because we have... No, no, all I'm asking is your opinion. I, you, okay. Your opinion, opinion based on all the investigation you've done. Because you've come in here as an expert to give your opinion, right? Yes. Okay. Now, based on all the investigation you've done, what is your opinion as to what the other critical factors, not just factors, but what critical factors are? So I believe that... Um, Religiosity is a critical factor. Yes, okay. and, and indeed, that's what you say here. Yes, I do. Right? I and, and you don't list any other factors at all here, do you? No, that wasn't, but I did later on in the article. Well, did you list any other factors later in the article that you call critical factors? <clears throat> I believe, I, among other things, I listed... Sir, can I just get you to answer the question? I promised your counsel I was going to be through by now, and I'm now, about, I'm, I'm now over my time. And if you could just focus on my questions. Did you list any other factors? I, did, I didn't list any factors? others that were critical, but I, again, haven't done an investigation as to whether those other factors were critical. I think some were certainly important. Um, in fact, in the article, you say that the opportunity to establish gay marriage was lost in large part because California's Democratic coalition divided along religious lines, correct? Can you put, point me to that part of the article, please? First of all, I, I will. It's, it's pages 57 and 58. But what I'm really asking is, that's your view? It helped me to be able to see it. So, oh, but, 57, 58. Yeah, I don't have any objections you're looking at, it, but you understand that I'm asking for your opinion. Yes. And, and is it your opinion that the opportunity to uh, establish same-sex marriage in California was lost in large part because the state's democratic coalition divided along religious lines? I think that the analysis of the article is that there oh, was... Please, Mr. Dr. Miller. Your, right. Honor, Your Honor, we have... Uh, the, the witness has been being cross-examined for about two and a half hours. He indicated about an hour ago he's a little tired. I'd request that he be given a 10-minute break. Well, uh, there's something about pots and kettles talking about long cross-examinations, <laughs> Mr. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> but it might be helpful to take a break. I clear the air. So we'll take uh, 10 minutes and <clears throat> resume at uh, 10 minutes after the hour. <clears throat>